Good morning, my name is Jeff Keeney. I'm the director of the LSU Ag Center Botanic Gardens at Burton. Today we're gonna to take a virtual tour of Windrush Gardens. To understand the beginnings and where Windrush came from, we're gonna learn a little bit about the history of the Burton family. So let's start on the porch of the Burton house. William Pike um, originally bought this property at a sheriff's cell in 1861. He had a niece by the name of Emma Barbie, and she was in love and getting married to a John Charles Burden. So Emma Barbie and John Charles, after they got married, um, had been to uh, the property, and William Pike decided to give them, it said, the property as a wedding gift. So Emma and John Charles moved out to the property into this house right here house was already here. Um, it's a very simple house, a two-room house uh, with a center hallway. So they moved out to the property and if you look across uh, the front lawn off of the porch of the house, you see a small creek that runs through the property. John Charles, looking at that creek, um, reminded him of his home in the Cotswolds of England. And at his home there was a creek similarly that ran through their property and it was called Windrush. And thus we get the name Windrush for the property. Now, John Charles and Emma uh, were farmers, simple farm family. Um, there's about 450 acres on this property, and they began to raise uh, cotton, cattle, corn, the basic staples of uh, any farm family. Um, they also started to raise their children here. Um, they had, they raised seven kids, believe it or not, in this simple house, and um, unfortunately, John Charles uh, died an early death um, after the last child was born. And so Emma moved back into Baton Rouge um, with her family. Now, the children uh, of John Charles and Emma, one of them's name was William Pike Burden, after his uncle. There we go, we're good. You have to pay, pay attention here because the Burdens love to play with um, the, their, their names. And so um, William Pike uh, Burden uh, fell in love with a Miss Ollie Steele. Um, and Miss Ollie Steele's dad was actually the state treasurer. Um, so Miss Ollie Steele and um, William Pike fell in love and they would take trips out here to the property. Uh, no one had, was living here at the time. And they fell in love with the property and decided that this is where that they would make their home too. So William Pike and Miss Ollie moved out to the property where they began to raise their family too. And just to understand um, how simple of a life the Burden family is. Okay. Let's take a peek into the Burden house real quick. So again, a very simple house. We have a dining room here on the left, the central hallway that was used as a living room, and to your right is the bedroom, one bedroom. So um, this is where they begin their life. Now, William and Miss Ollie, had three children um, that they raised in this, uh, at this property. And that really begins the story of how Windrush Gardens became uh, to be. So- Can you tell people where Windrush is? Okay, so the question is, where is Windrush Gardens located? Windrush Gardens is located um, at Burden Museum and Gardens, just off of the Essen Lane and I-10. So we're at 4560 Essen Lane. And to get to the gardens, uh, you go through the Royal Life Museum uh, to enter it. So to continue the story uh, of the Burden family, um, we're with William uh, Pike Burden and his wife, uh, Miss Ollie. Um, the first child that they had's name was Ione Burden. And Miss Ione um, was a very intelligent woman. Um, she got her uh, bachelor's degree at LSU in the early 1900s. So for a woman of that time, uh, it was very impressive that she got her degree at LSU. Um, she then got a job at William and Mary and worked there for a while. She got homesick and she decided to come back home and she got a job at LSU as Dean of Student Affairs and worked there the rest of her life. Um, so you can see that the Burdens uh, at the very beginning had a very close tie uh, to LSU with, with uh, Miss Ione. The second of, of the children, name was uh, Pike Burden and of course he was named after his dad and his uncle Pike Burden and Pike Burden was quite an entrepreneur. Um, he started a printing company and he got the state contract to do all the printing for the state 
And so he did quite well for himself. Um, he was also kind of a prankster and very well known in the community for his, his uh, prankster, his, his being a prankster. And he was also a World War I pilot. He had a plane on the property and a landing strip. So it said that um, when the legislature was in session, he would fly to the Capitol and buzz the Capitol just to let them know that they needed to keep doing their job. So um, just, just one of the many stories uh, of Pike Burden. Uh, another thing that's very interesting about Pike Burden is that he was a magician. And so he, um, when Our Lady of the Lake moved from downtown Baton Rouge by the Capitol, where the Capitol is today, over here just across uh, from Ward Creek, across from Windrush, um, he started doing magic tricks on a weekly basis in the children's ward. Um, so Pike Burden was very well known in the community and he loved children. Um, it's interesting though that Pike and Jeanette Monroe, who he married um, and moved to the property with, um, never had any children. Um, Pike, um, as I mentioned, moved to the property and if we look across the porch here, um, over here to the other side, you'll see uh, Pike and Jeanette's house, we call it the pink house, and this is where they live. And we still have um, part of the Burden family, John and Francis Monroe, that live there today. Um, one of the last, or the last child, um, was Steele Burden. And that's who we're most familiar with. Um, named after his mom, Ollie Steele. Um, and Steele Burden was kind of the wonderlust of the family. He was the youngest. Uh, Steele Burden went to LSU for a little bit. Um, he also was in World War II. Um, but Steele traveled a lot. He traveled in Europe, um, and that's where he began to get his taste, I think, for landscaping and also for architecture. He loved gardens, he loved architecture, and he also loved art. So that kind of framed um, Steele Burden's life and the future career that he would have. Steele Burden had a little bit of quirkiness to him as well. Um, some of the things uh, that you might see here on the porch kind of lend to uh, that quirkiness. So, um, Steele liked to embellish things. So this simple house that the Burden family grew up in, um, he loved to do sculpting. So you'll see some of his little sculptures here. Uh, these plaques are from Steele. Um, these represent different parts of farming enterprise um, at both the property and in Louisiana. This one represents sugarcane farming. Um, he put uh, the shutters around the house, but also if you look up at the ceiling, instead of a blue, as we know, you see most uh, old Southern homes, um, you see kind of this rosy pink. And the story goes that, um, of course, back then, people spent a lot of time on their porches. It was the coolest place. We didn't have air conditioning back then. And so Steele noticed that when women would come to visit, um, that they would pinch their cheeks to make them look brighter and prettier. Well, Steele looked at that ceiling and he said, hmm, what if I painted that a rosy pink and the whole time that the women were here, that pink would reflect off their cheeks and they would look beautiful for the whole visit. So that's the story of the, the pink ceiling on the fort. Okay, that's a little bit about Steele and maybe his art and, and some of his influence. Um, but let's now talk about um, the gardens and how Windrush actually got started and Steele Burden's landscape design aspect. To do that, we're gonna walk out here um, into the garden and the first view that you see over here is um, a statue with a sugar kettle. Now Steele worked many different places uh, as a landscaper, a self-taught landscaper and landscape designer. One of the first places he worked was the Cottages Plantation uh, south of Baton Rouge for Mrs. Kai. Um, we have an old log, log book of hers and he signed it and he called himself the yard man. So, it said that Steele was asked by Mrs. Kyes um, about creating a water feature in her garden. And so Steele, looking around, being the creative person he is, uh, found a sugar kettle and he said that would make the perfect simple water feature. And you have to remember, uh, the Burdens were not a wealthy family. They uh, had a simple farm life. And so Steele was very creative in finding things and reusing things. So he took the sugar kettle um, filled it with water, put a statue behind it on a pediment, and the statue then reflected in the water, and voila, you have your water feature. So Steele's been said to be the first person, or the person, to use sugar kettle as an ornament in the landscape. Now to start to understand a little bit about Steele's uh, landscape design, um, you can kind of see it here um, with the sugar kettle and the statue. 
Um, he used a lot of green in his landscape. So you see the Japanese youth have kind of framed the statue. They have a dark green color with a needle type leaf. So that frames uh, Hebe here. Uh, then you see how he layered the rest of the garden around it. Um, he used the zellias, which were very popular at the time. Um, he also used Japanese ligustrum as a taller part. You see a Japanese magnolia here and then the pine trees behind. So that starts to give you some idea of Steele's landscape design and, and how he uh, built his landscape. Let's walk down the path here and take a little trip to the, really the first garden that he created in the landscape. And while we're walking down the path, um, this is a little more telling too of Steele's uh, landscape design and how he utilized things that were at hand. So Steele didn't have a lot of money uh, to build uh, concrete or paved pathways, so he used pea gravel to line all the pathways. The other thing is Steele uh, loved the 19th century garden, especially the English style garden with its semi-formalness, but also its natural landscape. And so we call this a semi-formal type garden style. Um, he wanted to make sure that his beds stayed true to form, and the only way that he could do that, he didn't have a way to line them, and so he used monkey grass or leary oak in most of his landscape um, to line the beds and to keep the form of the bed. You can also start to see some of the other parts of the landscape uh, design. Um, you see English boxwood here on the corners to anchor the corners. Um, you also see a dwarf yoke on holly on the other side. So he mixed plants a little bit um, because, again, he just used what he had at hand uh, in the landscape. A few of the other landscape plants that Steele used a lot um, was um, the cast iron plant. Um, he also liked to use um, the elephant ears. Um, and he also um, liked to use, uh, of course, ligustrum. So again, kind of that layering from lower um, up to higher. Now, it said that Miss Ollie challenged Steele one day. She said, if you like landscaping so much, um, then why don't you start creating a garden here at the house? She said, why don't you start at the back of the house? So Steele went to the back of the house, and this is where the first garden room, if you will, is that he created. Now, walking through this garden room, again, you can see some of the plant material used. Um, camellias, of course, were very popular at the time. And another plant that a lot of people uh, dismiss in the landscape is the Nandina. This was one of his favorite uh, landscape plants. Nandina has a lot of nice characteristics to it. Um, it fills in nicely. Again, it has a, a nice leaf, bipinnate leaf structure, um, which gives interest. Um, it has a nice white bloom in the spring, and then the berries form, and it has a red berry and some fall color. So it gives you a lot of different changes um, through the seasons, and also it's another bulletproof plant in the landscape. So we come into the first garden room. Um, Steel also worked um, downtown um, in City Park. He helped landscape that. Um, he also worked in Victory Park. Uh, Victory Park, after a while, uh, was found it needed to be used for something else and they created City Park and so Steele got one of the first fountains or the first statuary for the gardens which is this lady right here um, in the uh, lily pond. So um, this kind of began the structure you, you see of Steele using statuary in the garden. Now interesting enough we have some older pictures of the back of this house and this was actually where the cattle were dipped here. It wasn't this exact pond, but this is where they did the cattle dipping. There was a pigsty back here and a chicken coop. And so Steele began to transform this into a landscape. So again, your very formal kind of English style landscape where we have a circular garden here with the central focus of the lily pond. And off of this circle, you see these axes of pathways that go to different parts of the garden. Some of the other larger uh, plant material that he used, of course, were crepe myrtles. Um, these crepe myrtles were first planted in the garden. They're over 100 years old. So these are original to the garden. You can see that they're quite large and have that wonderful peeling bark, that nice uh, emphasis in the landscape that we like to see and something that blooms in the summer. Um, if we walk this way um, on through the garden to another one of the axes that we are passing the axes, um, you start to see some of other uh, steel landscape, uh, hardscape. 
again, he was very creative in what he did. So the old well here that we have in the middle of this pathway was also used as a landscape feature. Um, here he put a statue because it was used no longer, covered up the well, and put a statue of Hermes here in the middle of the landscape. So to lead your eye to the next garden room, if you will, um, he would do, use statuary to do that, just like they did in the former gardens of Europe. Again, we have English boxwoods at the corners to anchor the corners um, of the garden bed, um, Astodistra. Um, and here, once in a while, he would add a little color in the landscape, so here we put a few palladiums uh, in the landscape. Now, this first garden room was built in 1920. Um, Steele began to uh, expand the garden, and so in the 1930s, he created garden room too. So if we walk through um, this little archway of Japanese view, um, we start to come into garden room too, and you can see again, that using that style where we have a more expansive lawn. And again, the formal, semi-formal beds lined with uh, monkey grass, and then all of the different landscape plants um, that are used throughout the garden. Now, again, to lead you through the garden and to have you look at the different parts of the garden, uh, at the end of the garden here, your eye would come to another uh, statue. Um, this is Hermes again, whispering in the ear of Zeus about the mischievousness of the other gods. So again, he liked to use a lot of the, uh, the statuary of the time of Greek mythology. Moving through this garden, um, you can also see we've got sweet olives that he used quite a bit in the landscape. He used that around houses a lot because it gives you that scent um, during the daytime sporadically through the year. We have the Capstone Garden urns on either side of the pathway here. And again, the simple, um, the simple pathways um, made of sea gravel. Now, as we walk through this part of the garden, um, this work that we put in this garden, uh, restoring it. Um, this garden, after Steele passed away in 1995, um, got into a little bit of disrepair, and then we had Hurricane Gustav hit. Uh, Gustav, um, as most of the rest of Baton Rouge, we lost over 50% of our tree canopy, but it was really destructive to Windrush Gardens. There was over, uh, over a 100-year-old red oak right here where this red oak currently stands, it came down in the garden and crushed a large part of the garden. We lost a lot of plant material. And also, this garden, when Steele built it, was a sun garden, um, we had a shade garden because it had matured. So we had to rethink um, how Steele had planted this garden earlier. So we added, uh, once again, the red oak back to the landscape. This was planted just right after Gustav. So we could uh, start replanting what Steele's intent was. Um, you think of uh, gardens and garden history. Uh, one of the things that we had done by Susan Turner Associates is a cultural landscape report for this garden because we wanted to maintain this as an historic garden. And so that report details how the garden was developed by Steel and also how we needed to take care of it. So we try to maintain the garden as Steel planted it um, back in the early 1900s. So as we walk through this garden, you can see we have statuary again at the pathways to, to lead your eye to that pathway to stop and then take another turn. Um, we keep walking through here, and this garden room was created in 1940, the last garden room of Windrush Gardens, um, and the biggest garden room. So uh, this garden we have just recently started to renovate. You can see we have newer plant material in here. We lost a lot of the older crepe myrtles in Gustav, so we've added the crepe myrtles back. Um, new plantings of, of um, azaleas, and also again you can see the use of statuary here in the garden framed with the um, Japanese yew in the background. Moving into this garden, a much larger expanse of lawn, and this garden has a wonderful uh, mythological story of, um, of two figures. And again the statuary here is uh, Hippomenes, and on the other end of the garden is Atalanta. Now the story goes with Hippomenes Atalanta that Atalanta was a beautiful woman and she was very fast. She could beat anybody, man or woman, in a race. And so she said, um, she had many suitors and she said, okay, look, whoever can beat me in a race can become 
uh, my mate for life. So Hippomenes, being the creative person he was, um, took a golden apple and challenged her to a race. And so and after they started the race, they were getting close to the finish line. Hippomenes dropped the golden apple on the ground. Atalanta reached down to pick it up and he beat her in the race and therefore he got her hand. So just another wonderful story that Windrush Garden has to tell uh, through its statuary that it has. So let's start moving back um, through the gardens again and um, start to understand how Steele did his design of the gardens. Now, we have no drawing. Steele didn't draw anything on paper. It was all done in his head. So it said that Steele, when he would start to create a new garden, um, would come with either chalk or flowers and he would just lay out the beds, walk around the garden, lay out the beds, and most of the time he didn't have to go back and relay them out. So he'd lay out the chalk lines, um, come back, and, and which would be the bed lines, and come back and start installing the garden. And this was his landscape style. Um, Steel Burden was very good friends with a very famous architect uh, in this region named Hayes Town. They were very good friends. So if you ever see a Hayes Town house, an older house, um, a lot of times you'll see a similar design like we have here in Windrush because Steel Burden would then design the landscape of the house that Hayes Town had, had built. So that's another interesting friendship that Steel had and also just to show you his love not only of the landscape um, but of architecture as well. Dr. Keeney, don't forget about that they were a poor family. So. The other thing that you have to remember too is that um, the Burdens were not a wealthy family. Um, they were farmers. And the other thing is um, William Pike Burden actually died um, very early in his life, just like his dad, John Charles, did. And so um, Miss Ollie raised the three children by herself on this farm. Um, so they did not have a lot of money to put this garden in. and so. Steele did everything he could in order to get this implemented. Um, one of the things that Steele uh, liked to do was also painting. He was a self-taught artist. And so a lot of the paintings or the sculptures that he would make, the small figurines that a lot of people uh, have seen, um, he would barter for either statuary or plant material in the garden. So that's how he, how he came about a lot of this statuary, was just utilizing some of the talents he had as an artist. And it's kind of interesting too, a lot of the larger old historic gardens that you see in the south or any, anywhere across the U.S. or the world um, were gardens of very wealthy families. And so I think this is a very, very um, unique garden and something that we need to treasure because it was built upon um, a, a, a very uh, simple farm family um, was able to install and implement such a garden that we have uh, in, his, in the historical garden area anyway. Uh, today. So it's something that we as Baton Rougeans in our community need to be proud of and care of. Now, we're walking to um, the back side of the first garden. Um, if you remember, we went into the house. It was a simple two room house with a center hallway. Well, Steele and I own were never married. So they were living in that house with their mom, and so Steele decided he needed a place of his own. So Steele uh, built this simple garden studio right here, and this is where he spent a lot of his days, painting, and also people would come and he would visit in here in the garden studio. And you can see again, it's kind of got the eclectic uh, thoughts of Steele Burden, or how his design was. The simple little structure uh, with uh, the slate roof, and then on the side, he added the restroom with this really unique little archway on the side of it. And this just, again, gives you kind of the, the mind, idea of the mind and how steel burden uh, design work. So this was Steele's bachelor pad, or if you will, his man cave. Um, we'll peek inside just a little bit if uh, we can get uh, retain good connectivity because I think if you look inside of where he spent a lot of his life, you'll also just kind of get an idea of the man uh, of who steel burden was. So if you just walk through here real quickly, and see again the simple room, uh, but with a lot of things, uh, the sculptures and things that he liked to surround himself, uh, paintings and so on. So again, just another little peek into uh, uh, Steel Burden's life and his creativeness. Now if we walk outside of the garden studio, 
and take a look to the left, we'll see a Pigeonnaire. Again, still loved um, the old European style gardens. The oldies had Pigeonnaires, especially in the early and uh, mid 1800s. That's how they communicated. And so Steele bit, built this Pigeonnaire, but he, again, very utilitarian. It is the, uh, the garden shed that we store all the garden tools in. So another embellishment of steel burden, but also something that's very useful. So I think we'll uh, conclude the tour if we walk this direction towards the house once again. And um, to understand how this property actually became part of LSU, um, we go back to the history of the Burton family. Of course, Miss Ione was very tied to Dean of Student Affairs on campus. Uh, Steele Burden, actually, many people do not know, was the landscaper on LSU campus from about 1930 to 1965. So a lot of the things that he did in this garden, he applied to the landscaping campus. So if you go down the oak alleys in campus, those were planted by Steele Burden. The large crepe myrtles, the legustrum that you see on campus, that's Steele Burden. So that's another important, very important connection that Steele Burden had to LSU and the family had to LSU. The other thing is that Steel Burden, the creative mind that he was uh, at, during that same time, also came up with the Rural Life Museum. And so it's said that he found some uh, agricultural tools on campus, again, very being very tied to agriculture. He asked if he could bring them out here, and he started using them to create what we now know as the Rural Life Museum. So the Rural Life Museum connects to um, Windrush Gardens, so you have this really wonderful piece of history uh, right here in Baton Rouge's backyard. And so as the family got older, they had no children, Steel, Pike, or I own, um, they decided they need to figure out what to do with this property. LSU had started, LSU Ag Center had started doing some research out here. And so they decided that they would donate this property to LSU, both LSU A&M and the LSU Ag Center. And that occurred just a little over 50 years ago today. So um, we have something um, that not only LSU cherishes and uses as an educational and research tool, both Windrush, the museum, and the rest of the properties of the woods and the farmland, um, but also that Baton Rouge and our region should really cherish too. This garden does take a lot of, of upkeep, even though it was built or in, implemented uh, to be low maintenance, it takes a lot of upkeep. So I encourage you all uh, to come out and enjoy Windrush Gardens. Um, you enter through the Rural Life Museum for a small fee, um, but this garden is open seven days a week, almost year-round, and it's a great place, especially this time uh, that we're in now. Um, still, and these are Steel Burden's woods, uh, words. Um, this garden was implemented and meant for a place where it was a place where you had serenity, and also that you could think of days gone by and things of days gone by and have those good memories that you might have. And so I encourage all of you to come out, enjoy the serenity of the gardens and contemplate days gone by, and also uh, come back and visit it again and again. As the season changes, the garden changes as well. And the last thing I want to mention too, if you would like to volunteer and work in this wonderful garden, we have many volunteer opportunities for you as well. Uh, so just give us, uh, contact me at the LSU Ag Center Botanic Gardens and, and we'll get you set up for that. So I would like to thank you uh, for uh, being with me on the tour today. And again, you're welcome out here 